the general idea is you attach this rotating box onto the side of your chainsaw and then the box snaps down over a 2x4 and then as the chainsaw runs you can pull it along like this and it will cut a flat spot into a log. And thus you turn your log into some usable lumber. This is a chainsaw video, so blah blah blah, safety is the most important thing, don't do anything that I do, you know, it's your own responsibility. Also, I'm sure that your mill is the greatest and your top chainsaw is the best one you can buy, but this is the smallest chainsaw I own, it's probably the smallest chainsaw you can buy, and that's because it has a thin kerf and it's really lightweight. Also, everything here is just two by fours and quarter 20 bolts, real cheap, some drywall screws. I didn't even have to run to the store because the main idea here is that it's not rocket science. It's just putting a flat spot on a log like people have been doing for a bazillion years. Apologies for the combative attitude, but some of you see a video like this as an open invitation to give me advice. Uh, the first time that I ever milled a log, I just used a circular saw, cut from both sides and then a big long sawzall blade to connect the two cuts together. So what gets you through milling wood is tenacity. You can do this if you want. But I've milled various ways and this is a really simple way. I, I haven't tested this, but I feel certain that I can produce a usable result. Why am I confident? because I can do it without any jigs. With some practice, you can freehand well enough to run uh, your board through the planer and get away with it. I'll be using an MS-170. It's really lightweight, really cheap. Uh, as I said, makes a thin cut, and I have the chain extra sharp, so it should rip right through really quickly. And if it does take a little longer than a larger chainsaw would, it's worth the price because I'm able to work longer because I can hold this lighter machine for a longer period of time. Here's the chain I'm using. It's not the type of chain that's made with a 10 degree angle. It has a 30 degree angle. Yes, I'm aware that there are chains that are better suited to the purpose, but that's not the type of chain that I'll be using today. Okay, so you understand that this rides on a 2x4 rail that can be any length. I'm going to remove this for clarity. Dimensions first, quickly. It's 12 inches total. The 2x4 blocks are 5 inches each. The plywood is half inch plywood ripped to 2 and 3 quarters of an inch. The drywall screws are 3 quarters of an inch down, located at 1 and 4 inches from each end. The holes drilled through for these bolts are 1 quarter inch holes and they're 3 quarters of an inch down, located at 6 inches which is the center of the jig. The wooden washer things are just cutouts from a two inch hole saw. It's worth noting that if you're making some, you should make some of various plywood thicknesses and that way you can adjust if you change the bolts for different blade clearances, different thicknesses of cut. I saw somewhere Somebody had heated up a nail and put it in the drill press in order to reduce the temper enough on the bar to be able to drill through it easily. I tried it. It didn't work. Don't waste your time. Just drill with graduating sizes of drill bits. It's just like any other hard piece of metal. I drilled a one quarter inch hole to accept the quarter 20 bolt. The way that you're looking at the jig now makes use of two three inch bolts like this. Here against the bar, I used a brass washer in case it spins just because brass is a softer metal. And what connects the two 3 inch bolts together is a coupler nut here in the middle. Then there's a jam nut on each side to prevent it from coming loose. Why didn't I just use one long piece of all thread the whole way through? In a word, deflection. This bends more. It's just not as rigid as the solid piece. Also, the threaded rod will make more slop in the hole back here around the bar. It's better to just have solid material. Deflection is also the reason that I didn't just use one bolt to the inside. 
when you extend it all the way to the outside of the jig, you cash in on the diagonal strength of the entire wooden fixture and it just, it ends up flexing a lot less. Take a look. Notice how they move together. If I used a bigger chainsaw with a thicker bar, there would be even less deflection, but I can tell just from having used a chainsaw a bunch that this is rigid enough to make a reasonably straight cut. Yeah, put your money where your mouth is and get to the cutting, right? Uh, even if it fails, I'm still gonna post this, and then you can learn from my mistakes, hopefully. Okay, so I've rotated it a hundred times and nothing's come loose. That's why I switched over to the coupler nut with the jam nuts, uh, because something has to rotate somewhere for this to rotate, and you want a low spot, a low friction spot to allow rotation to occur before one of the bolts comes loose. We don't want that to happen. So it seems like in this jig, it likes to rotate right there. And so I'm thinking of making a washer out of some plastic milk jug, and then that'll give me a really low friction spot there. You need at least a half of a tube of graphite in order for this to work. Sarcasm. That is nice and tight. And then the last thing is this jam nut. That feels solid and smooth. It just feels right. Well, as right as this can feel with chainsawing with a chunk of two by four attached to it. Also note, because you might not be able to make this out on camera, but I sanded this really smooth, all the inside faces that will ride against the rail. And speaking of the guide rail, let's prepare that right now. It's nothing to look at cosmetically, but it is quite straight. The material we produce can only be as straight as the board that we're using. But, it's also pretty rough, so I have a piece of granite floor tile here with sandpaper on both sides. I'm not going to pass it through a planer. I'm not going to put, pass it through a jointer. I'm just giving it a flat sanding to help knock off any of those little bumps that might snag my apparatus there. I'll do this to the top, this side, and this side. The bottom goes against the log, so it doesn't matter. So far, so good. That made a big difference, but watch. You can see a couple spots where it catches, especially here. So a little more sanding to do right there. Here are the materials that we're working with today. That one is about seven feet long. It's at, a, at its bottom about 10 and a half inch diameter. This one here, it's about 13 or 14 feet long and it has about a 15 inch diameter at the base. Both are maple. They've been sitting here for about two weeks and the reason that they're white is because there's paint on the end to keep the moisture from coming out. Now, I want to talk about the limitations inherent to this design. It's very important to consider this. In terms of milling, this is as low commitment as you're ever going to get, but it's almost toy-like. It'll work for small things, but this bigger log, it's going to give me a problem. The maximum depth that I'm going to get here is about 11 and a half inches, and that's on a bar that 
the maximum cut I would normally get is about 14 and a half inches. So in order to get this here, I sacrifice some of my depth. If I keep this angle at 90 degrees, which is not entirely practical, 11 and a half tops. This is the price that you pay for the simplicity. Now, you might, you might suggest, why not add a bigger bar and a bigger saw? Because as the bar lengthens, so does the amount of error. The idea is projected error. If you look way out there in the distance, about 100 yards away, there's a utility pole. And if I wanted to determine what level is from here to there, you can't use a tiny instrument like this little 8 inch level because whatever reads level, if it's off just a little bit here over this 8 inches, that error is going to project out to feet way out there. I'll put a link below to a video about milling with an apparatus that connects to this part of the bar as well and it really makes a stable device that you know, the, the results speak for themselves. So go check that out. I'll put a link there. These first few cuts are just depth cuts. It makes a groove that I can just rub away by turning the chainsaw sideways. I'm trying to get it approximately flat just so that I don't lose any depth of cut later. The board was just fastened with three inch screws. Nothing fancy, just make sure it's stable. Oh, I should also mention that I really wish I would have used the draw knife to remove the bark because bark does dull your chain. But I tried using it on a similar log and it just wasn't ready yet. Logs are funny that way where there's this time where the bark just sort of peels away and if it's too difficult then it might not be worth the energy. The contrarian in me wanted to use this little chainsaw deliberately, just because everybody says you can't. It's my favorite chainsaw. I can't help it. I have a larger one, and I just go back to this one again and again. It's inexpensive, and I abuse it, and if it breaks, I'll buy another one. It's not a problem for me. There's another consideration, though. I have a 20-year-old back injury, and so a lighter chainsaw is really worth it to me. Results? Really nice. The one flaw was down here, and you can see there's about a quarter inch lip right there, where the bar kind of went out, but the good news is I did it because I was rushing it, I was getting excited, and I could feel and see that it was happening. So I think there's material there that I could just go over again and fix it up. I'll give it a try. Note that the best result happened when I kept the stationary at something like 30 degrees and just held still as long as I could. Starting and stopping for the, uh, the camera footage definitely caused problems. If, if I had my way, I would not record this. Okay, real quick, my early conclusions are, yes, you must have one of these. It's very easy to operate, very easy to build, and it's virtually zero commitment. Caveat, it works nice for a small log, but for this monster here, I don't think I would recommend it. Uh, but we'll see. I'll catch up with you later. I'm going to do the other side. Okay, this one went not quite as well. Uh, I was able to do a little bit better down here, but I had chain problems at the beginning, so I swapped out. I gave it a sharpen first, it still didn't seem to do well, and then I gave it a new chain. 
updated conclusions, this little chainsaw is too small. Yes, it can be done, but it's not very practical. You can do it if it's the only thing you have, and especially on a smaller log like this, but maple pushes the limit. All told, this is a success, but it's not ideal. Those slabs were not wasted. I made them thick on purpose because they're edge material for this pea gravel bed under the deck. This little garden bed was put in about a year and a half ago, so that's how you can expect it to hold up over time. Just be sure to remove the bark because bark just holds moisture and it'll make it rot faster. Okay, so an updated update. I was able to straighten it up a little better. It's certainly not bad at all. One thing that I want to advise anybody who wants to attempt this on, don't rush it. It's a lot of the imperfections in this are the result of me just trying to get through it fast. It's just really natural to want to push the tool to work faster. You just have to let it do its thing. Uh, after a little bit of practice, I think this could really do pretty well. I give it a B plus grade. Now, I didn't want to make screw holes anymore, so you'll notice in all of the follow-up cuts that I use clamps whenever it's possible. In order to use the clamps, though, you have to do this little clamp dance where you move the last clamp from behind the chainsaw to over to the center of the board again. It's unfortunate, but most of the work here is not chainsaw work. It's work that takes place around doing the chainsaw. Lots of carrying and grabbing things and running back and forth. Probably the best thing about this process, though, is that with each cut, the subsequent cuts become easier because the log isn't as thick. About 15 seconds from now, it is pouring rain. More on that in a bit. What I'm doing here is using a circular saw to make a cut on each side of the board. And the idea is to cut the remaining part in the middle that's holding it together on the band saw. It's not the best way to do it. In fact, to be honest, it's awful. But I wanted to show that there are multiple ways that you can skin this cat. And also, at least in theory, it's not a bad idea because it makes a much thinner curve. Also, it's nice to just mix up the task because it gets tedious making so many chainsaw cuts. I'm freeing it away here with the chainsaw and I'll be moving it into the bandsaw in a moment. It kept raining and I ran inside with all my tools. We were, it was pouring on us and when I set my chainsaw down and turned around to get more tools, it caught me. So it's been a rough day, lots of bad luck. This is my first mated pair. I did one that's rough cut seven eighths and that one's about an inch and a quarter. Uh, I don't like the bandsaw method, it's pretty awful. I put a circular saw cut on each end and the cuts rarely ever line up perfectly. So look what I have. It's within the realm of what you can fix with a planer, but I just wish it were a little bit better given how much work it is. For the remaining three boards that are left on that beam, these three boards here, I'm just going to use the jig I like the chainsaw jig much better. It's faster and easier. And the cuts really aren't bad. With a little bit of practice and some patience, you get a pretty nice result. From the edge of your guide rail, you have one half of an inch for plywood, 
and three quarters of an inch for that plywood spacer before the kerf of the chain starts. So you have to add those two numbers up to determine how much material is the smallest amount of material that you can use this device for. The good news is that once you get it that small, the remaining board can be moved to the table saw. Keep an eye on your clamps. They can rotate loose while the chainsaw is running. All of that for seven boards. That's it for now. Now they just have to cure for a year. Uh, they range in thickness from, uh, I don't know, about an inch to an inch and a quarter. And after they air dry for about a year, then I'll run them through the planer and give them better edges, straighten them up. That's a lot of usable material for me. So is it worth it? That's for you to decide. For me, every once in a while, sure it is. Uh, one more thing, I put polyurethane on the ends just to keep the uh, moisture from squeezing out of the ends too quickly. And I'll keep these out of the sun and off the floor and stacked with spacers between them nice and flat. Thanks for joining me. Hope you found this somewhat interesting and useful. See you next time. Next time will probably involve a slightly bigger chainsaw.